Alaska, America's coldest, largest, emptiest state, is prized for two very different reasons. It's untouched wilderness and it's oil. Immense profits flow through these pipelines, but the burning of oil is causing global climate change, as the people of Alaska are starting to discover. The weather really changed. Every winter we have like mild weather. When we were kids, it was cold. Winter time, it's really cold. When the weather was cold, dogs, some dogs used to freeze. Our parents used to have really warm gear. I remember my father, my late father, he had um, long caribou legging boots about this high. And us children, we all had fur clothes too. People don't use that kind of fur clothing that much anymore. The Sam family have always lived deep in the Alaskan interior, in the native village of Huslia. There are no roads connecting them to the outside world, so the remote community of 300 Athabascan Indians gathers much of their food, clothing and shelter from the land around them. But their traditional way of life is under threat from global warming. Temperatures here are rising about 10 times more quickly than the rest of the world. Since the 60s, the winter average has risen by 4 degrees centigrade. This whole place was so, it's all lakes. We used to paddle down with canoe during the summer to get to our camp. No, we, we got to carry our canoe now. It's all over. It's, it's, it's not only right here, it's this whole area. If you fly around and do pay attention real close, you can see how the lakes are shrinking just by looking at the uh, receding shoreline. Because the trees used to be on the edge of the lakes, but now there's fields from the trees to the lake. Scientists suggest that the increasing temperatures are melting the frozen ground and the lake water is simply draining away. Bad news for the wildlife. Now that it's on a dry lake bed, this beaver house has been abandoned. We used to hunt around here, muskrat and ducks and stuff, but now there's no water, so we, just no fish, nothing. It's just, everything just running out. Every year it's, it's just getting harder and harder and harder to live up here. This native Indian community is not alone. All across Alaska, it seems that everyone has noticed the increasing temperatures. I think the weather is changing quite a bit. Um, the winters, the summers here, the winters have been quite a bit milder. The snow has been a lot less. Like this winter, 
only about a couple days uh, we got down to 25 below and that was it. Uh, we were ho hovering around zero, which is very unusual. I've been really uh, struck by watching ducks um, swim in the Chena River uh, all, all winter. Christmas time, January, in the dead of winter, and they're all swimming around. They're not supposed to be here. You know, they're supposed to, they're supposed to be south already. This anecdotal evidence is backed by scientists working at the University of Alaska in the main city of Fairbanks. The international team of climate experts is led by Professor Gunter Weller. As the climate warms, snow and ice melts. Now. So you have uh, snow and ice melting, more solar radiation being absorbed, greater heating, Greater heating, in, in effect, melts more snow, so this positive feedback loop uh, is actually one of the main features why, why we have uh, an amplification of the climate in the high latitudes. This is a complex explanation, but I can't make it any simpler. Much of Alaska is built on a layer of frozen ground up to a kilometre thick, the permafrost. It hasn't melted since before the last ice age. But over the last 30 years, this icy layer has warmed by about one and a half degrees centigrade, causing havoc as the ground beneath the city melts. And when that happens, the house collapses uh, and uh, has to be abandoned eventually. This has happened along here in this neighborhood uh, all the time. Uh, and uh, three or four houses which used to be here are no longer here because of this effect. Uh, you can see how it has sagged in the middle there. Uh, and uh, will continue to do so if more ice melts out. And eventually, if it really gets very bad, the house might have to be abandoned. Yeah. See a shim, this piece of wood here? That's a shim. It's elevating that leg to make it kind of level here. This, we have to um, hold it like this. Because if you want like two cuts of water, like if we do it like that, it will like, go like that. We have to hold it up so it's level. Repairing permafrost damage is costing Alaskans about $35 million a year. New houses now come with adjustable legs. Unless we do something about the use of fossil fuel, then uh, the climate impacts will become worse and will be a real serious problem that we should, uh, should have, will have to take care of one way or another. Uh, I think I would take this very seriously. The US government does not seem to share this concern. Famously, they pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol, an international agreement aiming to reduce the effects of climate change by decreasing dependence on fossil fuels. America refused to sign and instead wants to expand oil production. North America's largest field is here at Prudhoe Bay on Alaska's north coast. We do offer a tremendous supply of, of domestic oil and we can produce it in, in the, under the strictest environmental rules in, in the U.S. And it comes from an area that has been set aside for its oil and gas potential and it comes from an area that uh, very few people are going to visit because of its remoteness and, and harsh environment. Now, President Bush wants to drill on the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Anwar, an area east of the oil fields that has been protected since 1960. Its nickname, America's Serengeti. Bush's proposals are currently stalled in the Senate, but the oil lobby is fighting on and finding support from an unexpected quarter, the human inhabitants of the wildlife refuge. 256 Inupiat Eskimos live here, in Kaktovik village. They subsist on caribou, seals, muskox, and three whales per season. Yep, this is... Mighty fine taste and stuff. See, we cut the cut the blubber off. You know, it's just too fat. A local government survey 
reveal that 80% of the population are in favour of the oil industry's plans. We'll get our school funding instead of being cut. We'll have um, money for the children so that they can have better education. You know, we have it good right now, but we need, they need more better teachers. We'll have better health care, mainly jobs for the young people. Many local services are already paid for by oil money. The oil industry is cautiously welcomed here. Yeah, I'd like to see oil drilling in Denmark. You know, I think it'd be all right for Alaska or for this town also. Give us jobs, what we all need, you know, get money, buy stuff we need. It doesn't cost so much. <laughs> the Kaktovik people's support of the drilling has not endeared them to their neighbours. Three hundred kilometres south, on the edge of the wildlife refuge, the Gwich'in Indians of Arctic Village are campaigning against the proposals. We don't want drilling and don't support it there because we have a very close and spiritual relationship with the caribou. We're caribou people and, and our life is connected with our caribou way of life because it's our clothing, it's our story, it's our song, it's our dance, and it's our food, and that's who we are. Every year, 130,000 caribou converge on the coastal plains to give birth to their calves. This is where President Bush wants to drill for oil. There's really only one suitable area for calving that uh, has a combination of, of low numbers of predators and good forage condition during the time when the calves are born, and that's the coastal plain of the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. If caribou were to be displaced from there, they would undoubtedly be forced into areas where they'd have lower calf survival and higher death rates. No, there are no scientific studies that support that the herd is going to be hurt or the herd has experienced any problem in the Prudhoe Bay area. Sure, there's, no, there's a shifting of where the herd walks and such, but it has not affected the, the, the number of animals nor the, the health of the herd. To back this claim, the oil lobby produces promotional videos showing caribou happily grazing next to pipelines. But anyone thinking of studying this contentious issue should be warned by the story of Ian Thomas, a young map maker working for the US Geological Survey. I love my job. I'd stay there until midnight making maps. It just, that was fun. That week I made a thousand maps of National Wildlife Refuges, another thousand of national parks, and I put them all out on the internet for anyone to download. And I made this one map showing where baby caribou hang out in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Ian's map clearly showed that the area proposed for new drilling coincides with where the caribou have their calves. But this wasn't anything new. It's not, not really a big secret. That was the amazing thing about my map. It's not anything other than the existing public data summarized and made to look pretty and understandable. News of the map's appearance on the internet filtered through to a meeting between Ian's bosses and government energy officials. By Monday, Ian was out of a job. A spokesperson for the US Geological Survey stated, since the contractor was operating outside the scope of the contract, in violation of federal contracting regulations, that task was cancelled but Ian sees things differently. I think it was panicking bureaucrats. I think that they simply wanted to control sensitive information that the public would find very interesting but might not be what the people in power want the public to know. Back in Arctic Village, the Gwich'in Indians are continuing their fight against the drilling. We think to protect the porcupine caribou birthplace will keep the caribou healthy and uh, in return it ke it'll keep us healthy and uh, connected and to who we are. We don't really see ourselves as separate, you know. 
we're not looking down upon the land and animals and seeing it as different than us. We are a part of the system that exists up here. I think most people in the world maybe would consider where we live out here full-time camping or something, you know. But, but uh, even to us, you know, there's, it's just what, you know, the way we live and we're happy with that. Why they want to come up here and jeopardizing the uh, way of life of uh, Eskimos, Indians? It's, it's not. It's not worth it. How do I feel about it? No oil drilling. <laughs> I don't think there should be drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I think the United States is a rich nation with plenty of resources and we don't have to go into our last wild places for more energy. The politicians and leaders in the oil industry have talked with us and pretty much told us that if we decided to support their efforts in drilling in Anwar, that we would benefit from it economically. But that doesn't appeal to our people. We're not interested in money. But most Alaskans are interested in money. The oil industry generates about $50 million every year, and the Alaskan people are on average America's wealthiest citizens. 80% of our income comes from oil and gas, uh, so people see the advantage. Uh, the university where I work was built with oil money. We're used to this um, excessive uh, lifestyle and it's very difficult to wean us off it. Every man, woman and child living in Alaska personally receives about $1,500 each year from oil profits. Most are in favor of plans to start drilling in the refuge. No. Oh yeah, you betcha. Develop it. It will. It'll happen. Definitely. I'm a big supporter of going ahead and uh, utilizing all the natural resources that we have available to us. It'll bring more money, but uh, still, the you know the wildlife, they're gonna have to move them to another, you know, somewhere else, another habitat or whatever. So, you know, kind of, I'm against it actually. I'm actually for Amwar. I think we should pump our own oil. I, I, we have it. I don't think we should get it from Iraq or Iran or wherever we get it from. This is a favorite argument of the pro-drilling lobby, that the US should aim to become self-sufficient in oil, particularly after the events of September the 11th. We're importing over 60% of our oil from foreign sources, and these foreign sources are not, um, and do not have the same interest in, in America's uh, security as, as we would like to see. Um, it's important to develop domestic sources of oil, um, produce at home. But environmentalists claim that the amount of oil in Anwar would only supply America for about six months, an argument which may have helped persuade the U.S. Senate to vote against drilling. No, it's not true at all. Anwar could produce up to 1.5 million barrels a day for over 30 years. All wheel drive, is it all wheel drive all the time? Or this is, is it shifting and out of No, this is drive? a full time four wheel drive full, system. Full it's like the drive. Audi, similar to your Audi Quad 8 4 system. Yeah. Uh, transfer power from front, back, left to right. Gives you 100% of power. The average US citizen produces about twice as much carbon dioxide as the average European. The American economy is driven by big cars like these sports utility vehicles, powered by cheap fuel. It's until we either change our lifestyles or, or we come up with some other kind of source of energy, then we're pretty much stuck with what we've got on hand, and oil is what we've got on hand. Most people in Alaska would agree, but is pumping more and more oil really the only option? 
if you produced uh, more energy sufficient SUVs like the one we're driving here now, uh, <coughs> I have to admit, um, we would uh, in three years save as much energy as uh, Anwar will ever produce. So. Next month we're putting up solar panels in our village to, to begin generating our electricity and energy from the sun and I think that we're hoping to, prov to provide an example you know, of a community that can live on the land and with the land and still have energy you know, to use you know, even up here in extreme areas. The oil industry has brought Alaska great prosperity, but every barrel of oil sent south and burned comes back as rising temperatures and permanent damage to the delicate balance of Arctic life. On Alaska's west coast, the Inupia Eskimo village of Shishmaref is at the sharp end of the western world's dependence on fossil fuel. The village sits on an island just a quarter of a mile wide, and for seven months of the year they are locked in by sea ice, frozen all the way to Russia. But global warming has now melted the sea ice by almost 40%, which changes everything for the people of Shishmaref. The currents have changed, ice conditions have changed, and then uh, the freeze-ups, uh, the freeze-up of the, the uh, Chukchi Sea out here has, has really changed too, to where uh, we used to freeze up like in the last part of October. We didn't freeze until that, around Christmas time, I believe. That ocean out there should be, under normal conditions, four foot, four feet thick. I went out, the ocean ice was only one foot thick. My mother, she made me uh a pair of polar bear skin mucklucks and he's top of a wool ring. There's reindeer hair and seal skin on the bottom. These are excellent for extremely cold weathers, like for uh, 80 below, almost 100 below zero. Your feet never get cold. Life here isn't just adapted to the cold, it depends on it. The thick blanket of sea ice is the villagers' hunting ground. Any changes affect the people's ability to find their food. While we're waiting for the shore ice to freeze up for subsistence purposes, all the game is traveling east. You know, we can't get out there. And it is affecting uh, the subsistence lifestyle of this community. Because last summer, we covered thousands of miles by boats, hunt, trying to get walrus, nothing, except for one boat. We found one walrus. It's getting harder and harder each year to um subsistence uh, way of life, especially when you got to go further out. Uh, springtime actually break up and we burn a whole bunch of gas and getting harder and harder each year. Put the shell in there, put it on fire, and then shoot. With less sea ice to protect it, the village is becoming more and more vulnerable to the increasingly violent weather also a direct result of climate change. The storms are, they're getting more fr frequent. They're, the winds are getting stronger. The, the water is getting higher. And it, it's notice, noticeable to everybody in town. You know, it, it just kind of scares you inside, inside your, in, in your body. After a ferocious storm in 1997, Three houses toppled into the ocean when the fragile ground beneath them gave way. Nine others were relocated by jacking them onto sledges and pulling them to higher ground. The government declared a state of emergency. But the situation seems hopeless. Over the last 40 years, the villagers estimate they've lost almost 500 meters of land. We're, we're like in a panic mode because of uh, exactly how much ground we're losing. If our airport, our runway gets flooded out, eaten away, there goes our evacuation by plane.
The people of Shishmaref are paying a high price for our oil-dependent lifestyles. The fragile Arctic ecology has been hit first and hit hardest. But global climate change does not respect borders or bank balances. It will affect everyone in time. Meanwhile, the Shishmaref villagers sit and wait for the storm that will destroy their island. I'd hate to be here when it hits. But yet, if my kids are here, I'm going to have to force to stay here with my kids. We can't predict these storms. We can't tell what's going to happen tomorrow, in other words. We just take it day by day here.